Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion. Uh, Vandana will be moderating the panel discussion today. And I'll basically hand it over to her. Uh, stage is yours, Vandana. Thank you so much, Bhavan. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, today at the panel, which is diversity in cybersecurity, we will be discussing a lot of things, especially if I talk about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is one of those areas which is picking up big time because whatever we do, uh, the companies, people, everyone is getting breached. So we need cybersecurity. And as per the reports, there's a huge amount of skill shortage in this area as well. The one thing that can help fill the gap is diversity. And it is not just about di gender diversity. I, I, I do support the different communities, but when it comes to diversity, diversity uh, from different uh, countries, from different areas, different age, different uh, uh, continents. So today, if we, if we talk about the diversity, this di panel is also diverse. Um, here we have Hitesh from Belgium. But I will let all the speakers introduce themselves. I'll just touch upon a bit on them. Hitesh is from Belgium. Judy is from Kenya, Nairobi. Shaira, my friend, is from Israel. So we'll start one by one, and they will introduce themselves. And then we'll go straight into the panel. So Shaira, let's start with you first. Perfect. Thank you so much, Vandana. It's a pleasure to be here today with these great panel members and all the audience that joined us. Uh, my name is Shira. And today I'm the CEO of a cloud security company called Solvo. Solvo is a product that helps developers to produce a more secured cloud products automatically. Uh, but putting that aside for a moment, uh, I started this company with my co-founder David about a year and a half ago in the heart of the pandemic, while we were not sure if this is the end of the world or not. Uh, but uh, I was never a, a, that kind of a, a geek or PC kid that uh, really loved computers. Uh, I had a, a, a normal uh, childhood, uh, I liked uh, reading books and uh, running outside. Uh, but uh, like every Israeli at the age of 18, I was drafted to the military. Here we have a mandatory military service and I was picked to serve in the Israeli intelligence. Uh, and this is where I was first exposed to the world of cybersecurity. I had no idea what that means. And uh, this is where I started my career. But from two years, it turned into a 13 years long career uh, in cybersecurity in the Israeli intelligence. Four and a half years ago, I decided that it might be the right time for me to understand what is the tech industry outside of the military is all about. So I just left the military, you know, with no other job, nothing really specific I knew I wanted to do. And I started uh, doing public speaking, which I will uh, elaborate uh, more about later. And I ended up in a cloud security company uh, where I was leading uh, the intrusion detection product. And after that company got acquired, I knew that now is the time to start my own journey. And this is uh, how I ended up starting Solvo. Thank you, Shira. That's amazing. Over to you, Judy. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Vandana. Uh, uh, so my name is Judy Ngure. I am uh, from Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, so I have a very, my, my journey has not been that long uh, and I think uh, that's good because considering all the work that we've done so far, I'm, I'm very, very impressed uh, and very, very delighted to be here with such a you know, beautiful <coughs> audience and you know, panel. So I started my journey, I haven't, I have grown up years here, but I didn't start with the, you know, the, the computer gig or, you know, computers were introduced to me when I was in college, when I was doing a business course, actually. And then when when you were, you know, being taught how to use Microsoft Word or Excel, uh, you know, this Africa, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't get any own access, uh, you know, now it's different. Uh, and then the very first time I interacted with a computer, I was 
I was mind blown. I think the, the one thing that excited me was the fact that I could do calculations with Excel. That was very interesting to me back then. And I was like, this is the path I want to take. So, uh, you know, I've been a very, uh, you wouldn't, you know, there are those kids you see and you're like, this one will be a doctor, this one will be an artist. Uh, I think for me, people are like, this one might end up in jail. Uh, but, you know, now, <laughs> Now, I think uh, that turned out to be different because my path was just not defined and I like that and I got to, you know, define it myself. So I joined the computer science class and uh, I think I, I, you know, being in that class felt like something was, you know, I was making a difference, I was actually fulfilling a part of me. And, uh, you know, I started uh, computer science, but I started as a developer. I started, you know, writing code, but just creating uh, web apps. Uh, that's actually what got me through college. I would create websites for companies, get paid, and then pay my school fees. It was very, very interesting. And when I finished, I, you know, the first job I used to do was a web developer, but I got bored at some point. When one day I was, you know, I was, I was actually interning, and this, uh, I don't want to say Chinese, Asian guy, let's go with Asian guy, <laughs> uh, was working in the company, and they found some vulnerability with the application I had created. And my job was to find out how he did it and bring back the site because it was a customer, it was it was a customer site, and the following day I had to do a presentation. I spent 48 hours trying to find why there is an excess on my site. It was the worst 48 days, 48 hours of my life. And I was like, I need to get to whatever this is. I need to find out how to get into it. And that's actually how I started getting into security. Just I started learning from this guy. He taught me so much. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. So uh, coming to you, Hitesh. Now, Hitesh, we would like to introduce yourself. And there's another thing that we want to know with that. Okay. What was the first computer that you uh, got your hands on. And don't oh. worry, we're not going to judge your age based on that. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, so, I mean, my interest in security began. Uh, my interest in security was there, but I didn't know that my interest was in security. What I mean by that is uh, that time it was mostly taken as an interest in computers rather than an interest in security, right? Like I did not know that what I'm interested in is called cybersecurity, right? I just like fiddling and twiddling with computers. So, um, yeah, so this is sometime like back in, uh, when I was in school, my, my dad brought home like a Pentium computer and um, it had Windows 95. So, uh, and like there was a computer at my uh, dad's office, which had MS-DOS, but I rarely got to touch it uh, as, as a mischievous kid. But like my proper first home computer was a Windows 95. So. Uh, the reason I got into computer science, mainly you can say that I used to tinker with it. I somehow decided that, you know, Windows doesn't organize its files really well. So I copied everything into one folder and I rebooted and it wouldn't start. So that's when I understood that, yes, the places where the files are kept is kind of important to a computer. You can't just willy nilly move things as you like. So uh, I had to bring the PC back into shape before he came home that evening and turned it on. So uh, it was like a six hour race against time to fix Windows 95 as a as a 14 year old. So like these are the kinds of things that I got myself into. Uh, I would build computers like, you know, using off the shelf parts for and, and give it to people and they would treat me to a small snack or something like that. Right? So uh, coming from 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 Belgam, which was at that time, like a very small town. Um, these were the kinds of things. And then, you know, I got access to the Internet and so on and so forth. So that's how this whole thing uh, began. Like uh, back in the day, if you had a broadband connection, you could actually, uh, you know, scan your way into your local network and see what's online, what's not online. Like you can't do that anymore, but uh, for, for good reason, you can't do that anymore. But uh, that's how this interest began. I mainly, I run a company, run a company called AnnexGate and uh, we do networking and security. Um, we write software, uh, Python forms a good portion of the backend software that we write. Uh, so for me, it's been a real enabler if you personally ask me and, um, 
I did my engineering master's degree. I worked in a company called FireEye in the Silicon Valley Bay Area for like four or five years. Then, uh, then I came back to start my own uh, in Belgium. So, so in a brief, like a short uh, summary of what I uh, have been doing all these years. So, I'm very, very glad and honored to be part of the panel. So, thanks for having me as well. Thank you so much, Trera. Uh, we'll come to you. What was the first computer or programming language that you got your hands on or uh, you got to learn that maybe in school, maybe in college? Was it me now? Sorry. Yes. Yes. OK, good. So thanks. Um, maybe just before I tell about my first programming language, I wanted to share a short story about how I got into a, a public speaking and, and doing some work around uh, diversity. Um, when I just left the military and didn't really have a job, I decided to maybe give some, some lectures, but it wasn't that simple. Uh, I was approached by a conference that asked me to speak about cybersecurity. And I, I thought to myself, well, why should I talk about it? I mean, there are so many experts out there. Who am I? to speak about it with only 13 years of experience. Um, so I said, no, I'm not gonna talk about it. You, you need to find someone else. I can help you find someone, but I'm not the right person. And I said like, why not? Uh, and I ran into an article about why aren't there were more women in cybersecurity. Um, and the article said that uh, women don't see other women in the industry. So they don't have a role model and they assume that it's just not for them. And after reading that, and that was about five years ago, I decided that I have to be on stage just to show other women that it is possible and that there is room for everyone. Uh, and this is how I, I started doing uh, public speaking regardless of my, uh, my day job. And the first time I got uh, to do programming, was a uh, first year of university. Uh, uh, we learned uh, C++. That was uh, really my first time I ran into uh, any, any kind of programming. Uh, since then, I did most of my programming as more of a, a theoretical uh, uh, thing. I was, doing, I was using mainly MATLAB for research purposes. And ever since then, uh, if I have an idea, I try to implement it with MATLAB and then ask more talented people uh, to, to do it with, uh, with Python or with a more popular and more useful uh, language to build software. Uh, so this is my programming experience. I don't practice it every day, but I preach about it a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, if I go back in time, I can remember there were so many things that were there and then you have to pick and choose which programming language uh, you have to learn and then uh, now they are most of them are not in use because they've just uh, gone away now we can see so many new languages talk about java like java has been there but then python is picking up big time and we are at pycon uh, talking about all of this now uh, when we talk about these languages these languages are also actually very diverse different people are picking up different languages based on uh, the kind of things that they want to build on right uh, now i can see that an organization has uh, more than 20 languages where they're building their web applications right so this is like becoming more and more diverse and that's when uh so when uh so for for the audience now if i have to uh share one story when we were all at the backstage um and uh, we were preparing prepping ourselves so we were discussing like what diversity is all about in this panel. So like I said that um, I am from Bangalore, Hitesh is from Belgaum, uh, Judy is from uh, uh, Nairobi, and Shaira is from uh, uh, Israel. Like there is, but still there is uh, like, we can see that the country diversity is there, city state diversity is there. And then we do have a gender diversity here. Generally, we say we need to have one woman on the panel. Here, we can say we needed one man, man on the panel. So uh, that's a I good would problem like, to have, though. 
Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, Hitesh, I remember you you were sharing some really, really nice stories about how you started different initiatives or how your group started different initiatives in Belgium. Because uh, when you started talking about Belgium, you you mentioned that, do you know Belgium? Because I know it because I'm in Karnataka, but they're not, there are many people who don't know about it. But it's still a place which is sure. um, growing at a very high pace. And there are many initiatives from the diversity side and not just I'm I'm not talking about gender diversity, but including kids, including college people, students or including people from um, maybe different age groups. I know you've been doing that. So we would like to know about that. Like what have sure, you been uh, contributing uh, to? Definitely. And just on the outset, like it, I, it's, it's my it's me speaking, but it's probably the work of uh many other people who 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 I am speaking for so uh take what i say as being 115th or probably 120th of my contribution but there's a lot of people behind the scenes so uh we run uh, a lot of initiatives we have this uh, thing called make a space belgam uh in the city we uh, run the science hack day india chapter out of india out of belgam also so what i we have noticed the following things right one is that um you me or probably everyone on this panel is fortunate enough to go to a school that has an english education right uh and most of the times that's not the case in at least a lot of uh tier two and tier three cities in india yes there are english speaking schools and things like that but uh not not as much as one would want it so it's it's nice to see when we we bring a lot of students from different schools together so we may have like 10 or 15 students from a school in the eighth grade or the seventh grade, uh, which is a Canada speaking school, which is a local language, uh, and bundle them up with another 10 students who come from an English speaking school. So, uh, and they sit and figure out simple problems together. They either build a small motor for themselves or they write. Uh, the last time we did a workshop was in something called Kutipai, uh, basically trying to use a small microcontroller. So it's, it's, there is a, there's a, good amount of uh, feedback that we get after these events where uh, people from you know uh, students from schools that mostly have people who are quite well off uh, meet students from other schools who are not well off and try to understand how to communicate with someone who probably doesn't speak the same language as you right uh, that goes a long way in uh, trying to tell a 12 or a 14 year old that hey listen there's this other side of the world that probably you will not see maybe sometime until later in your life until you sort of graduate and go uh, see the outside world but in even in, even at the age of a school student right they are able to uh, talk to each other with uh, and try to solve a common problem maybe there is sort of a jugadu technique a small hack that the rural school student has learned living in his village that the city school kid doesn't know about and vice versa so they get to see a lot of these kinds of things and it's very nice to uh, make at least the people who come from the rural school believe that they are if not brighter at least as bright as the students sitting uh, studying in a school that is in a bigger city so it acts like an equalizer and helps them give that confidence that it's it's not necessary for me to be in in like a capital of a of a country to be able to uh, build something right so uh, once they uh, once they themselves can once they convince themselves that yes, I can build something, then it's just a matter of if someone takes an interest and takes it forward, or it doesn't take an interest and leaves it. That's okay. But at least they know that they can do it. Right? That that makes a big difference. So we've been doing that Science Hack Day uh, ever since 2016, and uh, even though I have not been part of it uh, in the last chapter because I, I mean I was getting married, but uh, the team does a phenomenal job. Uh, uh, year on year, I, I would encourage people to go and look it up online and, and see uh, what they can find. And I'm sure it will amuse them. Uh, yeah, I think this is amazing. And I, I just stuck to one word that you said, which is Jugadu. So uh, huh. to the panelists and uh, to everyone who is listening, some of you might be aware, but most of you who are not aware of this word, this is like um, getting the things done in a totally innovative and a different way. So we Indians call ourselves, and especially some engineers, specifically engineers, I would say, um, they call themselves Jigadu because they can make things work in totally different way where people not, will not even imagine. Like on this panel, we all have contributed in, in totally different ways, right? 
and uh, coming from different background it teaches us different technologies different way of doing thing and even thinking now if i go to judy judy has been contributing to bringing more people more diverse uh, contribution in nairobi area i have i have not seen many people doing in that area so i would like to hear from her what's her experience and actually how did she she started her uh, diversity initiatives trainings and uh, ctfs in that area um, thanks uh so yeah it's true with the you know uh, i think i not mentioned this that uh, i was able to do in 2019 yeah 2019 uh, we founded a women of security chapter here in nairobi and uh, you know that was just to do you know diversity inclusion we uh, we as a continent we have a low number of women in tech overall actually uh, not just cyber security in every aspect of technology so uh, you know women of security was you know was here to solve that problem uh, actually this occurred to me when i was in a meeting and when i looked around i realized it was me there to discuss the tech and then there was a ciso a sorry a cio lady at the table but then the table was of around 20 people and those were the only two women in the cybersecurity uh, area. And we were there to discuss about strategy. And I was, I was like, this, this has to stop. So our this need to be solved. So Women of Security was born through that. And, uh, you know, we were just there to make sure, you know, uh, that we have, yes, enough number of women in the industry. But it wasn't about diluting the industry. It was just bringing in the right people with the right knowledge. So if you find the people with the people with the passion, but then they don't have the knowledge, how do you solve that problem as well? So Women of Security also brought that aspect where we were uh, training guys, uh, you know, on different areas of cybersecurity because we don't have cybersecurity courses in my country. Uh, we don't have, you know, like a four-year program where you can learn about cybersecurity. Maybe once in a while you go to Udemy or you go to LinkedIn Learning and find a course that you want to do. But physically speaking, it, we didn't have that much. So, uh, but then there were, you know, cybersecurity incident incidences coming up, especially with a country like mine where we are digital digitizing almost everything now, especially payments and we had cybersecurity incidences, but then we didn't have people to solve them. So there were opportunities, there was demand, but there was no supply. And the supply that was there was just biased. So we had to change that narrative. And women of security came in, in play to do exactly that. Yeah. Absolutely. I've seen the, 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 uh, the things that you've been doing and contributing and changing the face of Nairobi. Uh, I could see there were so many awards, there were so many initiatives that's been taken. So kudos to you for that. Coming to you, Shaira. I remember you've been, uh, you've served in Defense Forces and your journey as a speaker has been totally incredible. But we do want to know, like I personally know you uh, from so many years, but I am sure people at the panel and uh, people who are listening to this panel do want to know your contribution in the diversity initiatives which you are leading in uh, Israel. Um, I'm happy to share a little bit of that. Uh, my focus uh, was more around uh, uh, women in cybersecurity in recent years, even though Hitesh's work is so impressive and inspirational because he brings uh, the opportunity to everyone, uh, uh, regardless of, of their gender. And it's also very important to enable the opportunities. Uh, um, but my focus uh, in, in the recent years was around women in cybersecurity because I just realized that less, even though, even looking at my military service, right? You have about the same number of men and women is starting in cybersecurity in a way maybe even more women but as you climb up the ladder you see less and less women around the table until i did not see it as an unusual thing to be the only woman uh, uh, on the table and um as i left the military it only looked natural to me that i'm the only woman uh, in the room i didn't feel uncomfortable about it and i didn't understand 
why are there so many organizations trying to help women in the tech industry or in cybersecurity? I just thought to myself, well, if you're good, then you're going to succeed. What's the big deal? Why do you need an extra push uh, to do that? But only when I started working, uh, I realized that maybe I have a thick skin, but there are so many junctions along the way that, uh, in a way, show you the way out or not being supportive enough to give you room uh, in the table. It might be a small comment from someone. Uh, it might be people just m not making you feel a part of the team. Uh, it's the topics that they talk about. It's the jokes that they make. Um, it's you not being promoted because you want, might uh, want to be a mom in the future. So it's small things that show you that uh, you don't have the, the room and this is not for you. Um, so I thought this is when I started realizing that it shouldn't be this way. And it's bad for the industry. It's bad for everyone that this kind of behavior is the norm. Um, so I started a mentoring program uh, here in Tel Aviv called Security Diva. And uh, we brought uh, women who wanted to get into cybersecurity and women from different areas in the cybersecurity industry, from marketing to uh, uh, incident response. We had everything. And we met, uh, it was almost one-on-one -on -one sessions, but you could uh, walk around and talk to anyone you wanted. Everyone introduced themselves, what kind of help do they need and what kind of help can they provide. And most women got to talk to all the other mentors. Uh, we had a really great event. And a few months later, I was in, in my office uh, uh, taking the elevator and I ran into a familiar face of a woman. So luckily she was wearing a name tag. So I quickly took a look and she saw I was staring at her and she said, hey, did you organize that uh, um, uh, diversity meetup uh, uh, a few months ago? And I said, yes, what are you doing here? And she said, I got my first job in cybersecurity. And I was so happy for her. Uh, so I told her that she has to be the speaker for our next event. And she came and she told her story. And given her background, really, she had every excuse to give up. She's a mom. She immigrated uh, uh, with, with her kids to Israel. She didn't speak the language, but she decided she's, that she's going to get into cybersecurity and that she's going to do everything it takes. And, and she did it. And it was super inspirational. And uh, I thought to myself, well, we need more success stories. Uh, so we're recently during COVID, it was really hard to have these kind of events. Uh, but we keep on, on trying to have online events or one-on-one -on -one meetups uh, uh, just to enable this kind of, of experience and, uh, and mentorship. Totally amazing, Shara. Um, now, yeah. coming to you, Judy. Yeah. Do you think she wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Shaya. Thanks for your words. And I, if you allow me, uh, if you've noticed, uh, adding to what you're saying, if you've noticed in the last, uh, say, 12 or so years, I mean, this is this this is something that I noticed back when I was in grad school, like doing research from under my professor, right? So if you if you draw, uh, if you look at how um, platforms and social networks and um, communication platforms online have become more sensitive towards uh, female abuse, especially. Uh, all these issues have been taken care of only when there were women at the table who had a stake in saying something, right? So, because I, I remember uh, a good, uh, a friend friend of mine was abused, like had, had to undergo abuse on, on, a, on, on a platform online, right? It's only in the last six or seven years is when that platform actually fixed the problem. And that happened because there are people like you guys who are pushing more women to come into cybersecurity because otherwise, uh, pardon my French, but we would not have an idea of what what we are doing, right? I mean, uh, when if you you can solve a problem only when you face the problem, right? And uh, sometimes people on the other side of the gender scale don't face the problem. So uh, I see that especially when it comes to cyber economic uh, offenses, is when like things have gotten better for uh, the the world overall because people say that, hey, you know, there's this form of abuse that you guys never experienced because it's not directed towards you. So 
yeah i i wholly agree with with what you said and in the more uh the more uh, different voices at the table probably the more better things are uh, overall yeah absolutely and it's it's more of uh, our mindset needs to be changed that yes we can do it and there was one point where um, uh, we'll agree that uh, we don't see more of role models who are allies who support us who are yeah. being there and uh, if we see that yes people are there talking about these things that yes we need more people in different areas and not just in cyber security but in general tech because if we see the number of people that are there in it they keep on getting reduced over a period of time because sometimes that they feel oh i might not be able to do it or uh, they feel that yes you have to take this journey alone so not everyone is able to sustain so it needs uh, people to support each other now the way industry is picking up big time wherein uh, there are so many new languages which have come there are platforms which are getting changed uh, we are shifting to cloud we are talking about iot we are talking about ai we are talking about 5g and what not now when these technologies are uh, coming up even if you take a break for like 2 months you feel guilty that why did you even take a break i know i have a friend and that's not a woman it's a man who wanted to take a sabbatical because that person wanted to do an mba and that person was thinking big time that should i go for it or not whether i'll be able to come back or whether i'll get a job or how it will be like you have so many misconceptions and we all have that it's just that till the time we don't share it we don't share our experiences we would never be able to move ahead and i think i had so many misconceptions about myself also but people like shara juri hitesh you like people like you helped me overcoming them being on the stage i was a total introvert i would i would say till college i never used to speak to much people and now ask me to talk to like 10000 people i'll just go ahead and start babbler, blabbering about it and especially cyber security i can speak in my dreams <laughs> so yeah hitesh you want to say something bye uh wanted to hear from judy since you wanted to ask her something yes yes yeah. so judy yeah i want to ask you like all of these experiences now you've had in uh, nairobi as well so from your experience how exactly people are perceiving python as a as a motivator as a, a, a driving force in nairobi area like uh, what are the some most uncommon like common stories we hear from everyone but most uncommon stories you've heard or you've seen people playing around with python or any other language i think uh uh huh. so when it comes to python and security it's a big thing it's a really big thing i don't i don't think uh i've seen guys do uh you know it just uh, the one language that seems to stick in every talk or in every ctf or in every presentation is you know uh let me automate this with python it's easier to automate this with python yeah uh, i think uh, i've seen a lot of python use in cybersecurity in the in the in the last few years to a point where i was like do i need to learn do I need to go back to school and learn this python thing man uh, and then every tool you run it's you know you have to have some python dependencies or like okay uh, this is crazy then i need to understand you know at least uh, some python cuz i was more conversant with bash and you know everybody is just seem to make it make it sound so easy to use python rather than any other programming language especially in cyber security and you know we we are as a community we are obsessed with automating a lot of you know they say automate the boring stuff and uh <laughs> it seems to be easier to do that with python uh, i've seen python conferences here and you know when you you know when you do such a conference you expect python developers to be in these kind of conferences but you see cyber security people like i just attend python conferences where because i want to see what is new uh what are guys doing what what has been automated with python and it's easier to use uh as compared to a lot i feel like i'm selling python should i be 
<laughs> I feel like this is a, a Python sales page, but I can say there's a lot of Python use in cybersecurity in not just Nairobi, uh, present Africa, uh, to, in most of the event conferences and people that I've talked to. Uh, than I have seen even uh, maybe in uh, you know in other development areas. Uh, it's mostly being used on cybersecurity frontier, and I get it. I get why. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether people know this or maybe it's for the benefit of people listening to the panel. But uh, especially if you're on the malware side, or I think Shia might know this if you since you did intrusion detection, right? If you're reverse engineering malware at any point and you're uh, either dealing with like a tool like IDA Pro or uh, now Radar is a new tool, right? Uh, it is, it, it, if you know Python and you get into this kind of domain where you have to use these tools, it's almost like a superpower, right? Because uh, uh, I remember writing tons of Python scripts in IDA just to be able to unpack malware, right? Like had I, had I not known Python, that would have been a big in impediment for me. And uh, yeah. it takes, I don't know, for people who, are the, if I, there are other people who reverse engineer malware, but it takes hours and sometimes days to unpack a single binary, right? So uh, the fact that you're, you're able to do, I mean, and, and that's the point where Python is the only language, right? Like we always talk about where do you apply Python, but if you are in the reverse engineering domain or, or in the binary analysis domain, Python is the only language like you uh, I think there is C++ also but then that's like living life in extra hard mode right so uh, I could never do that but probably it helped a lot so there is so many uh, especially whether it's you're doing offensive cybersecurity or defensive doesn't really matter you are going to at some point uh, if, if you hit a wall and you know Python it's going to almost feel like a superpower of sorts so it's uh, I think it's the tool if I have to like place a bet and say, say that if, if you're in security and you don't know Python, then it can get difficult. But if you know it, it's, it's, there's nothing like it. Uh... Absolutely. Coming to you, Shaira. I can share that uh, uh, Python is the newest uh, language that I learned after uh, mainly doing uh, most of the my programming uh, uh, in C. And um, I just remember during the course that I took, uh, the, the instructor says, uh, okay, now let's write a, you know, a code that will take this array and do those things and put those uh, item in those. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it with a for loop and another loop inside of that. And like, no, this is done in like a single line of code. What, what is wrong with you? Why, why, why am I doing it in like 10 lines when you can do it in one line? So Python is a very, very, very easy and intuitive language to use. Uh, and I think that this is why uh, it's the go-to for most people who need to learn their first coding language. It's the right thing to start with. It's, e it's easier than other languages. It's very useful. It's very popular. And also from the cybersecurity perspective, it's really easy because other tools were written in this language, and it's really easy to integrate your new tools uh, uh, to the existing frameworks. Um, so I think that uh, it's super useful. Uh, I know that many people ask themselves if they need to uh, know how to program in order to be in cybersecurity. The short answer is no, you don't have to program in order to be in cybersecurity. There are many different roles you can do uh, without being a programmer. But having said that, I always tell uh, uh, people who ask me that I highly recommend getting even basic uh, uh, coding skills because it's the difference between walking and, and having wheels. Uh, you, can, you can make it to those places, but you can make it faster and more efficiently. Uh, so it's only up to you how do you want to get to, to new places. I totally agree. And I think uh, Python has given uh, wings to s us in cybersecurity where we can develop tools in Python, which are like, it's just a script, but it acts like a tool. And if you need to execute these scripts on any of the servers, it'll be so easy. So I feel that it has uh, improved my hacking skills in a positive way. 
where people say, yes, hackers are bad, but we do hack our organization to secure them. And now when, um, when we talk about Python or any other programming language, they do have some kind of uh, uh, syntax, some kind of uh, experience associated with it. So I want to know your experience uh, per se, wherein you have uh, got specific recognition because of that working. Or maybe tool, maybe uh, the Shira, you're working on a product. So how it has changed that product. It is you worked on creating something for students, right? So how it has changed their skill set, their mindset around using these languages. Because I know that Python is not difficult to learn, not easy to learn. It's in the midway, but if someone starts liking it, that means it's going to go very long way for them. Because I've seen at my home, my brother started liking this language and he is just getting more and more into this. So what's your experience with that? So I'll start off with Judy this time. OK. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, let's see. So my best Python project, uh, I think I did it when I was doing, when I used to do a lot of bounty. That's bug bounty. And, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, 360, uh, you know, process for, you know, for getting, for finding bugs. So I used to get so bored at the beginning where I have to do subdomains and then I have to find the ones that are serving on, you know, uh, different ports and sorry, uh, different, uh, you know, server requests and then the ports. And they're like, okay, this this is a very tiresome pro uh, process. Uh, but then there were tools that were already, you know, available for this. Uh, so I thought, why don't I just put all these tools together? Just get, give me a simple output because this doesn't need a lot of human interaction. I just need a specific output. I need a, a you know subdomain that is a, you know it's a, it's a web. Uh, it serves on this port. Uh, you know is actually accessible on the web. It's not you know if it's an API. You know uh, I want this specific output. So I just created a program in Python. I'll just do this. So I just combine three four tools together, and the output you know it just saved me a lot of time. So I think that has been my best. I hope I can find that program. Uh, I haven't done bounty in a while, uh, but you know, I I was able to I was like that is something that was worth you know me doing uh, learning Python you know online and uh, you know I I still feel Python is you know it, even now I still use it especially for th uh, you know threat intelligence, uh, but then that was I think that was my starting point in understanding why I'd rather use Python. To do a lot of cybersecurity work as compared to, you know, other uh, other languages. Yeah, and it's easy to learn. It's like Python, if you've done C, C plus plus, Python is like English. C, C plus plus is like speaking. I don't know what language is that. <laughs> it's Greek. It's Greek versus English. Yeah, and uh, you know, we don't know. I don't know how to speak Greek, but I think English is easier. Yeah, yeah. But so I think that's 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 my best experience. Yeah, coming to you, Hitesh. Yeah, so uh, two things. One is that, especially with uh, what happens with, with ha what I've seen happen is that um, we normally interact with kids that are in the seventh, eighth, or ninth grade. So they've not yet actually been exposed to C and C, right? So um, sadly, we don't control curriculum at, at universities uh, yet. Uh, but we have seen that normally when they start writing in Python, they automatically are comfortable with adopting more complexity going forward because they see that if there's this one language that can do um, a simple addition or subtraction in two or three lines of code, uh, then maybe this is for me or this is not for me. Uh, usually what happens is that people have to make that call once they are in uh, a, a degree program or something and they have to start with C, right? So it at least helps them make that decision. Okay, I understood Python, it was fun. Let me try and grasp a language that is probably a little more complex in the way uh, things are defined in the language, right? Um, the other thing is that, uh, especially like for me, how it, it, it helps it helps a lot, especially in security is that um, I did, I was a research assistant for a couple of years, like when I was doing my degree, right? So 
my job was uh, gather data on Bitcoin, its prices, its fluctuations, things like that. Right? What do I use to get the data? Python, right? Scrape everything, download it, dump it into a database, do the analysis, give it to my professor, we write a paper, right? This is Python is sort of the bare bones for it. I'm reverse engineering Android malware. Every APK is a zip file. I need to unzip it, pass the XML, work into the job, Python, right? I'm, I need to write some shell code, need to remove uh, slash uh, null uh, hex bytes, uh, try to obfuscate the shell code, then pass it to a program, what do I need Python, right? So it's sort of been like a Swiss knife uh, for me. And uh, it's, I think that, uh, I, I would not go as far as to say that you probably don't need programming in cybersecurity. Maybe you don't need it if you're choosing not to do exploits and things like that. But if you if you choose to do things like exploits, you obviously need to this. Uh, but there's quite a lot you can do in cybersecurity without knowing programming. Like, like the, it's like 85 or 90 percent uh, that way. But um, if if you sort of uh, if you are uh, if you know Python and want to get involved in security. Maybe I can talk to you uh, in, later on, but it's it's a big enabler if I have to say it, right? And uh, in fact, most of the code that we write today as a part of products in our company are on Python, right? There's a reason for, for that, right? Because um, it just, when it works, it works. You don't have to worry about it, things like that. So um, I think people who like uh, tinkering and are, are good with Python should especially explore uh fuzzing and and exploit kind of techniques with with python and maybe that might incline them towards uh whether either do they want to be on a red team of or and actually red teams in most organizations now have a developer on board right because it's not they need someone to to actually whip up the exploit and and package it properly and 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 do it reliably right so it's not just that you know someone crafts an exploit and it's done you need a programmer in Python who can sort of package it as well. So I know especially that the, the bigger companies now which have red teams have developers, full-time developers as parts of those teams. So uh, it's it's a wonderful thing to have uh, if you if you know Python. Absolutely. Coming to you, Shaira, how was your experience with the different projects that you've worked upon using Python? Uh, so we as a company decided to write our product uh, using Python. Uh, we use a uh, serverless technology and uh, it made a lot of sense. Uh, it seemed like uh, um, Python is quite popular today with the developers. By the way, when we do our hiring process, we don't look for a specific knowledge in, in, in Python because even if you come with a Java background, uh, you will easily pick it up. Uh, so, so when when we do the, the hiring process, when we interview uh, candidates, we always ask them to write code in the language that they prefer and that they feel more, most comfortable with. Uh, again, most of our software is written in Python, but uh, but we know that a, a developer will learn a new language if they need to. Uh, not specifically with us, but generally speaking, I think that the, the opportunity to write microservices, uh, uh, potentially, if, if you are an organization with uh, uh, 20 different languages, then uh, they can all uh, orchestrate really well because uh, every microservice stands on its own uh, with an input and an output. So even if uh, one of your developers insists on a, a writing a, in COBOL, uh, it's probably going to work. Uh, maybe it's not the best thing to do, but it's going to work. Uh, so, so this is our experience with Python. We, we really like it. By the way, we recently published uh, a survey that we ran uh, with developers in different kinds of organizations, different sizes, and asked them about their favorite uh, tech stack. Uh, Python is definitely uh, one of the two most popular. Uh, uh, it was head to head with the JavaScript, uh, and it was the same uh, in every every kind of organization, from the smallest to the biggest. Uh, this is something that we we see all the time. Uh, so I think that Python is definitely here to stay. 
Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Now, before we part ways, I do want to know one piece of information from each one of you, starting with Hitesh, we'll go to uh, Judy and Chaira. If you can recommend some podcasts, newsletters, books, or talks, which you really like or feel people should know, especially the Python community should know about, uh, those should be around cybersecurity. Um, so when it comes to um, Python and cybersecurity, I feel, uh, and this is probably biased because of what I like doing, uh, I think that it, if you can, uh, if, if you're someone who's looking to uh, uh, build uh, any kind of, like let's say you, you just want to learn pen testing as a skill, right? Uh, being able to just, being able to craft, uh, you know, fuzzy HTTP messages and things like that uh, is, is a skill that you can do even if you just know basic string formatting in Python, right? So uh, it's, it's you know, at least I feel that if you're, uh, I wouldn't go on to say that if you're trying to learn Python for cybersecurity, go and learn a library. I would say that try to apply what these basic things are uh, in ways that are more oriented towards security, right? For example, um, you you want to write a simple, uh, t you know, connect to a TCP socket, send in some shell code, right? Something very simple, right? It's a socket program. Uh, shell code takes probably a few bytes to write, right? So you don't have to overwhelm yourself in learning something major. Uh, yes, uh, it depends upon where you go. Like, for example, if you really get into reverse engineering, you will have to, you know, read about the libraries that come for reverse engineering tools and things like that, right? Um, but but overall, most uh, uh, cybersecurity tools and, and tasks that we automate using Python are using the, the standard library of Python, right? Probably nothing else. Uh, more than that. Uh, also, I mean, this is something that we do, right? Most of our security products have a front end and all that front end is written in Django, right? So uh, a web developer has a space in, in security as long as he understands a bit about what's a port, what's a firewall, what's a, uh, what's a TCP stream and things like that, right? So it's it you have two choices, right? You basically bring in 20% of security into, into your uh, programming role and involve yourself in cybersecurity or learn 20% of Python and use it as, as an enabler for you to do things faster, right? So uh, it's it, it can go either way. But I think that for most cases, you're just okay with, with learning the base language and, and fuzzing things around uh, than to do something, something big uh, to start with. Coming to you, Judy anything that you feel that people should know and uh, we'll take one one more minute and then we'll go to questions i can see that the people are curious about cybersecurity and they are asking questions now okay. <clears throat> all right uh when it comes to podcasts i i okay uh so this is a, a learning process i learned uh, with cybersecurity, you can't consume everything at once. Uh, it's a bit too overwhelming. So uh, even when people ask, "Do I need to learn, uh, you know, a, a programming language <clears throat> for me to be in cybersecurity?" I say it's based on where you are in the cybersecurity uh, journey. Uh, so uh, the more you get into security, the more you probably want to automate a lot of the stuff that you were doing uh, manually before. And uh, you know, uh, when you when you're at that point, uh, you know you t also get to wanna learn specific areas of uh, you know of Python if you wanna work with Python. Uh, so for me, I'd say even not in terms of podcast, in terms of uh, just uh, learning materials uh, for you uh, when you want to you know streamline and work with Python. I'd say you know do the just work with what devs do because it's the same thing. You're coding. You're writing code. So things like Udemy, I am a big fan of Udemy. Uh, I have like 20 courses on Udemy that, you know, and, and for me, this happens because I, you know, I got into something that I wanted to learn how this works. And, you know, uh, and I prefer videos to, you know, audio. But when I was, you know, when I was learning Python, I also did the videos on Udemy. But then there's the W3 schools that, you know, if you're good with, 
the visual. Uh, this is a place you can learn. Uh, LinkedIn learning as well. Uh, I'm not sure about podcasts. Uh, maybe the Python bytes, but I don't listen to podcasts mostly. But um, that's also a podcast I've heard is very, very essential. Yeah. So that, that would be my recommendation. To you, Shaira. I have one short recommendation. Uh, I recommend all of you to join the OWASP DevSlop uh, project. Uh, it is ran by our friends, uh, uh, mainly Nancy Garishet from OWASP and a few other uh, really awesome women who interview every week a uh, one person from uh, uh, the development or security or DevSecOps a community, we learn something new, uh, we get to ask questions. Uh, so I highly recommend you to join every Sunday. It's also on YouTube, so you can watch previous episodes and learn about different aspects of how to do uh, secure coding. Absolutely, I'm a huge preacher of open source and uh... Yes, please do join and support the communities, learn from cybersecurity communities as well. Now, there is an interesting question. I know we're almost at the hour, so we'll just take this question and then we can have further questions on Twitter or maybe at um, the other cha chat box. So, uh, Judy, this question is for you that, uh, are there any bug bounty programs which where we can start off and how to get started in cybersecurity? Okay. Uh, when it comes to bug bounty, I think uh, that's a very, uh, very common question. Uh, I recommend the Hacker One, Hacker One One. Uh, the Hacker One platform has their own getting started into bug bounty, uh, you know, uh, content. So this is like the best place because you know this is a bug bounty platform. They tell you what to get into, what to do. Uh, then there are uh, there's Twitch. Um, I, I'm always streaming on Twitch when uh, you know guys come in and that they, they are learning from this guy who found this bug, this one who made a million dollars on uh, bug bounty. Uh, so also Twitch is a big place to be, and it's uh, you know free resource. Uh, all these I'm saying are free resources. You don't have to pay for this. And then there's the Udemy classes. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, the Udemy classes that I think Nahamsek uh, produced one that's very, very good. And I recommended it to most of my students when they're starting, getting started in bug bounty. Yeah. And he does have a YouTube channel. You might want to go ahead and check. Just sec check for Nahamsek, N A N A H A M S E C. Yeah. Nahamsek talk. And uh, there's a friend of mine called Yusef as well, is African Senegalese, also has a program, yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah, and now, um, question to you, Shaira. What are the top one or two tools or guidelines services you would suggest a developer that needs to know about identify security issues in web apps? Great, so it's really good that we talked about uh, OWASP uh, just a minute ago. If you're unfamiliar with OWASP, OWASP is a nonprofit organization that works uh, worldwide. So there is probably a chapter uh, near your home. And if there isn't, now during COVID, all the meetups are online anyway. So it's not a problem for you to be in Bangalore and join a meetup in Los Angeles. So, you know, the world is now uh, uh, very well connected. And in OWASP, you're going to learn about the top vulnerabilities on uh, web applications. And actually today it's in applications in general, also on mobile applications, the eye security. Uh, you will have all the information that you need about most common mistakes uh, and, and how to uh, solve them and also prevent from doing them. There are lots of learning materials and everything is for free. All you have to do is check OWASP's website and pick one topic. There is probably lots of material, written material and workshops around it. All you have to do is just start. Uh, uh, my favorite project is the uh, uh, serverless uh, project. Uh, yeah. You actually ra run a, a cloud formation yeah. template and spin up a, a serverless application and you can start investigating it. 
Uh, you don't have to write the application, so you don't have to know how to code, but you are using an application on your uh, uh, private uh, AWS account. Uh, it's really fun and it's very, very useful. And thank you to Tal Melamed who created this uh, great project. Wonderful. And I am a huge fan of OWASP. Um, and if you are all in Bangalore, I am one of the chapter leader for OWASP Bangalore. You can reach out to me anytime. I'll be more than happy to share any resources that OWASP has or just look, go to OWASP.org. And there's so much more that you can look for. And we do need help from uh, people who are working on Python to help around different projects that we have and specifically developer security. Uh, now yeah. coming to you, uh, yeah, coming to you, Hitesh, there is a question. Uh, how oh, do you okay. address the issues while developing a software like monitoring or uh, monitoring a dark web for women and child abuse content and alert system? It may affect the mental health of people. So it's more around um, scrapping the dark web. Yeah, so um, first of all, I mean, if you're doing work on this, kudos to you because it, it's, it's a very hard thing to work on, uh, which is substantiated by your second point thing. You know, how do you, how do you be sensitized when you're working on it? Um, I don't think I have a good answer for it because uh, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, don't be affected and think of it as a job, right? Because uh, if you are going to be looking at things that happen on the dark web, it might, uh, uh, it, it might disturb you to a certain extent by looking at certain things. But uh, I would say in that case, stop as soon as you feel that even for a second and probably don't do it for a couple of days. Uh, but it's sort of like you're doing God's work if you're doing something like this, because uh, I've seen of, I've seen less than my share of bad things, but I wouldn't want to see any more uh, at all uh, of, of the kinds of things that are there on the dark web. So. Um, Yes, it does affect uh, the you, you feel you feel bad that such that the Internet is being used for something such as this. But I frankly do not have a good answer to your question about how can we prevent this, right? Because uh, uh, it's it's practically not not possible, right? You uh, you you have if, you, if you're able to find certain content that is deplorable, please report it and, and hope that it gets taken down soon. Uh, we have done this in the past with um, people who do credit card abuse, and you will be very surprised that uh, like Visa and, and all these guys are very strict uh, in case there is money being used uh, for these kinds of services. Uh, I'll also be sort of uh, in, the net, in the Delta hall, uh, in the Delta hallway track if people want to talk a little more about uh, security and things like that. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I could, can say probably to this question. And uh, in fact, just before when Shira was talking, uh, Cuckoo Sandbox, which is a project uh, for running malware in a sandbox environment, is entirely written in Python. Right? So uh, I think most uh, malware engines would not be one tenth their weight in salt if probably Python did not exist. So uh, if you if you want to chat up more, I'll be hanging because I know we've exceeded an hour of our time. So. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in the Delta hall hallway track if, if you guys want to chat further. Yeah. Thank you so much to each one of you. It was wonderful discussion.